Hi, good evening. Um, I am very pleased to introduce our second um, brilliant pre-concert discussion uh, with Giovanni Zanovello, who is at the I in the IU Musicology Department, professor, and um, C. Keith Collins, who is um, an incredible, multi-instrumental, amazing human being. <laughs> Welcome to both of them. Thank you. Thank you indeed. <laughs> um. Um, so, uh, I have, uh, I suppose, a lot of questions about this program. This program is <laughs> fantastic for those of you who have not had a chance to have a look at it um, before coming here. Um, this is really a program, uh, a sort of before and after program, um, uh, marking the line of the Kingdom of Isabella Castilla and uh, the, a new approach. Um, uh, uh, towards uh, uh, religious minorities in the uh, Spanish Peninsula. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions to, to Keith, but uh, first I wanted to sort of uh, uh, design, say a couple of words about the before and after. Uh, the, uh, Spain in the Middle Ages was, uh, uh, today's Spain, in the Middle Ages was largely part of the caliphate, uh, one of the many uh, Muslim caliphates or, or kingdoms. Uh, and um, the um, uh, thing that, if, if we think of, uh, of uh, Muslim, we don't think today of uh, uh, necessarily religious tolerance because uh, the Sharia is, of course, not, uh, uh, in general, at least in our perception, uh, a particularly tolerant law. But in the Middle Ages, and especially in Spain, but in fact, pretty much everywhere, um, the um, uh, inclusivity um, of these political entities was remarkable. Um, the idea was that um, Christians and Jews living in the um, Muslim um, uh, caliphates were not infidels, but they were worshippers of worshippers of the right God in the wrong way, as it were. Um, so uh, the idea is was that all Abrahamic religions were, uh, in a way, um, uh, related, and uh, this uh, allowed for self-regulated communities not just to live but to prosper in the same cities and in the same neighborhoods. Um, when um, Alfonso of Castile uh, conquered Toledo in uh, 1085, he essentially was forced to adopt this kind of um, uh, this kind of uh, practice. And so, the early Christian kingdoms in Iberia had the same kind of uh, sharing. Um, and um, Muslims, but especially Jews, were integral part of the. Um, uh, uh, kingdom of Castilla, the government. Uh, they were working as officials and they were respected. Things changed in the 14th century, first with the Black Death and then the 100 Year Wars, uh, when uh, um, uh, aristocrats began to covet those uh, positions in court. And uh, with Isabel of Castilla, um, things turned uh, very quickly. Um, uh, very ugly. Um, she essentially created the Spanish Inquisition, as, uh, which is legendary, um, and uh, um, the Spanish Inquisition uh, essentially targeted people who had to either um, denounce other people or lose all of their belongings and be tortured, and so that um, did not go well. Uh, <laughs> um, and and um, essentially. Muslims and especially Jews had to run away. For Muslims, it was easier to find uh, places where to um, uh, take refuge, in Africa especially. Um, but uh, for Jews, of course, uh, there were many fewer options at the time. And many of them moved to uh, uh, Central Europe and Italy. And that's another thing for another concept. But, uh, um, but definitely, um, um, what we see here uh, in, in today's program is 
the sort of before and after of this change. Um, so my, my first question is, um, how did you um, start thinking about this? Did you start from pieces? Did you start from the history? What was the first, uh, or maybe from the theme of Blanf uh, this year? Yes, um, the real instigator was, I think, um, once we uh, heard what the theme was going to be for this year's festival, um, we put our heads together and began thinking about what uh, we could bring to the festival that might be um, something interesting to say uh, that also had uh, fantastic music. Um, at first, um, we thought about uh, the Bassano family, famously from Italy, who, many of whom moved uh, to um, England because for years it had been uh, alleged that they were in fact um, a, a, a Jewish family who had converted or sort of converted and then and then left England and then left Italy. Now, of course, we suspect that that's not entirely true, or maybe even not really true at all. So we abandoned that idea, um, and we came up instead with this approach of looking at the Inquisition and looking at what it was like, uh, musically speaking. Um, a sort of wanted to create a soundscape, basically, of what you might have the sort of music you might have heard, music played by Christians uh, and Jews uh, from the period that we're doing. So we start in the Middle Ages, basically. We do a one, you know, 20th, 20th century piece that we treat with um, sort of an early music uh, flavor, if you will, and then we, uh, you know, have a look at some of these different composers that are well known, uh, perhaps not to everyone, but I think you'll agree they deserve to be. Um, and then we end up with um, the wonderful music by Rossi, um, which is sort of, in many ways, a, a culmination, if not um, uniquely so, uh, of, of notated uh, music uh, in Hebrew uh, published in Venice. Um, we don't have, there's not a lot of this kind of music, of course, uh, for us to choose from, but we do have quite a lot uh, of, the, of music by Rossi, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, I'm glad that uh, you, I mean, as much as I love um, uh, the Bassano family, yes. I'm glad that you didn't fall for Lazos' <laughs> uh, uh, idea. They would be the only Jews running away from Venice in the 17th century, right. in the 16th right. century. So uh, it's like, okay, maybe, but the reality is that there was a lot of money in England at that point yes. for people with their kind of uh, expertise. So, um, and also the, the claim about there being Jews of is, um, has been disputed, let's put it this way. So, and uh, you talked about the glorious music, which uh, I couldn't agree more about. And, and I should also say that um, uh, Spain is an area in which uh, Renaissance musicology has lived for uh, 10, 15 years maximum, so it's much less explored than England. <laughs> Italy or Central Europe, um, and um, we're still finding a lot of things about Spain. For example, this music has, um, it's a notated source, so it's been known for some time, but uh, uh, the context around this music is uh, being explored actively. There are a number of projects uh, that are very exciting, so maybe we'll, we'll have uh, more um, ideas about about possible concerts um, uh, in the future. So you were uh, talking about uh, the uh, Rossi and the notated music. Uh, obviously, to some extent, you have to um, massage the notation because instrumental music is not written out, um, right. presumably as it was performed, at least in the first part of yes. your concert. What kind of things uh, do you guys do? How do you uh, channel a, a medieval or renaissance instrumentalist? Sure, yeah, that's really uh, the, the heart of a lot of what we do as far as the creative process is trying to get a handle on how do we do a, this, how do we um, make this music in such a way that reflects both um, its roots but also perhaps make it a little more accessible if needed. Now in the case of um, one of the earlier pieces, the, um, uh, uh, the cant from the Canticos de Santa Maria, which are, of course, the famous um, songs uh, that were dedicated to, um, or perhaps written some by, but maybe not, um, Al the great Alfonso X. And, um, you know, there are just dozens and dozens of these wonderful songs. They're notated. We have the words. 
Um, and we even have, you know, occasionally, of course, there are those wonderful miniature illustrations we have from the Cantigas that show us all these instruments, many of which are clearly not necessarily, um, to put it in, in a certain way, uh, the usual thing you would find throughout the rest of Europe. And so, you know, without um, going into to too much detail, we just sort of had to decide, you know, how would we interpret some of these images and with the music? And so we, we settled on using a hurdy-gurdy, um, which you'll get to hear in a bit. Um, as Kelsey may have uh, mentioned in the program notes, or maybe not, um, I think maybe it was just a Facebook post, but this is his hurdy-gurdy's second outing, so we're very excited to hear it now in, in, a, in a live setting. And um, this one happens to be a copy of like a slightly later um, uh, version, but the, the technology is the same. It's this automatic instrument. You crank, um, the, the wheel, which is rosined, and there are strings inside, it works like a bow, and then you push these keys, which intercept the string, which works like, you know, almost like a frets on a viol or a guitar or what have you. Um, and so, you know, that's an unusual sound to be sure. Um, and we added a, a, to that um, a little bit of harp playing. Um, I've got um, a harp over here um, that's a slightly later Renaissance version that has these brays, which make a buzzing sound. I've turned them off because the, cont the contigas are a little bit earlier than we might have had that particular technology. And um, then we um, did a, a little bit of digging on, on how we wanted to um, interpret. You know, this music is, is notated, or at least it's uh, transcribed in sort of the feeling of five, right, which is fairly foreign to us. We all know, you know, um, a few jazz staples that are uh, in five, for instance. Uh, but other than that, there's not a whole lot that most of us experience you know, with Western ears, music in five. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And so trying to wrap our heads around that it has been a bit of a challenge, I'll say that. Um, it took us about, you know, a, a good uh, a good chunk of our rehearsal time uh, with this piece, just wrapping our heads around how to think about that. Because as musicians, we all, can internalize thinking in three or two, but five is the combination of both, or maybe it's neither or something else, and that's been certainly um, a part of the process. Otherwise, um, you know, we looked at uh, for a couple of the other pieces where we just use the hurdy gurdy as a drone. Uh, there's sort of a, a, a ballad, um, you'll see in, in a way, a story setting um, that uh, you'll hear, and then also there is this, um, excuse me, there's another. Uh, song we do where it alternates with the various instruments, um, recorders, and the harp, and the hurdy-gurdy, and the singing, and she even does some, some vocables. Um, and she, in, she actually uh, improvises over these drones that we're doing, um, which I think you'll find particularly interesting. Um, she's fantastically uh, talented at that, especially, I think. Um, you know, and then for, for the later things, we relied on, you know, we're all products of the Early Music Institute or the Historical Performance Institute, and so we have, you know, uh, we hope anyway, some skills there to figure out how we're gonna interpret what we see on the page and then decide, you know, how much of that is, uh, you know, the music is not the notation, as we all know, and so making it come alive, you know, is also, of course, part of the fun process. Yeah, uh, thank you. And, and uh, the, the idea of instrumental treatises um, is very appealing, but we don't have any from, from before uh, the 16th century. So when we are looking at uh, centuries of music that we have, um, in which there's no evidence whatsoever on the notated sources that it was, with very few exceptions. There are a couple of manuscripts that, but we also have manuscripts that we know um, uh, belong to wind bands, in which the notation is exactly the same as uh, um, vocal manuscripts, including notes that under no circumstance would be possible to produce with a wind instrument. And um, we just know that musicians were so used to performing that music that they translated it in, in, in real time. And, um, uh, and so the improvisation that you mentioned is definitely uh, a core part of this practice. And I'm glad that you guys are uh, engaging in it. And, uh, I, I, Listen to you many times, and it's one of the things that I appreciate the way you um, you engage in this. Thanks, and yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun to do. It's not something that you can easily you can't. I find it difficult to teach it, but you just have to simply do it enough <laughs> to 
to become comfortable. You know, you have your bag of tricks that you're able to pull out at the um, drop of a hat and use those as, as you go. Um, and that, of course, um, is a, an ongoing process for sure. And there's no guarantee that what we're listening to this tonight is similar to what people listen to. But, uh, you know, uh, until we have a time machine, this is what we have. And we have people who are talented and who do their homework, and that's the best we get. And, and, and it's a very good best. Uh, Thank you. My, my hope is that, you know, if, if some of these musicians were alive today and they were heard hearing us, they would be no more horrified than perhaps Shakespeare would be were he alive to hear um, an Appalachian group do with accent um, his uh, one of his plays, you know, and I think if, <laughs> that's a pretty good goal if we can get that close. We won't know that, of course, but you know, it's a, it's a fun thing to think about. Yeah. Um, so one last question. I think we're running out of time, but one last question about uh, the second part of the program and the uncomfortable pieces. Uh, because there are pieces that have texts that, uh, uh, well, frankly, offend our sensibility and our humanity. And um, in my imagination, I try to imagine what um, what musicians felt when they were performing that. Were they completely on board? And were they just? I mean, in the case of Encina. Um, uh, the, the program notes mention the uh, anti-Semitic text, uh, but this is the Holy Week. So, uh, Encina, I don't think Encina, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think Encina got to write the text. Uh, it was something that was mandated by, um, by the church authorities. Uh, uh, but at the same time, um, of course, uh, there will always be debate about whether we need to hear this text today or not. And uh, obviously there are advantages to Forgetting, but also to remember. Uh, what do you think? Oh boy. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> you asked how they thought of it. I think they probably thought of, of it in similar ways that we deal with it today. I'm, you know, as a, I, I play a lot of Baroque music, of course, and so I each year get asked to play the St. John Passion, right? Which, of course, is its own, you know, whole uh, can of worms in many, many ways. Um, and, you know, listening to my Christian and Jewish friends and colleagues and scholars debate what to do about this um, is an ongoing process, and it, I think it will continue to be so. And I suspect the same sorts of things happened at that time. Now, you know, we don't know for sure how some of these musicians might have performed, especially if they were conversos, sort of these forced, forced, forcibly converted people who had to put on a face, perhaps. Perhaps um, it's hard. It's hard to know that, but. I think we can all well imagine what that may have been like um, at that time. We take the approach that you know we're going to present this music in an honest way that is both um, we think you know a a subset of, of the general mood of the time, but also being trying to be sensitive to what's going on today. Um, I will say that when we began this program, um, October sixth had not happened. And so we had to revamp some things for sure, um, things you really had to think about. Um, and I've, for me, that's a really important part of the music for any of us, is trying to tie in this older music to what's going on today and making sense of it. How do we use this to make the world better if we can? And sometimes um, the answer is we can't. And sometimes the answer is, you know, sort of, or maybe. And that's, I think, not, not such a bad thing at all. Thank you. And I think by, by showing in this program that religions living together is a possibility, um, yes. you're already doing a lot. Uh, just uh, flashing in front of our eyes the sounds of this uh, age, uh, maybe we can go back there, in, not next year, but, uh, <laughs> but thinking down the lane uh, and yeah. I'm really thinking that, that this program, in a way, uh, helps and shows that actually things have not always been like that. But Exactly so. Uh, if nothing else, a little bit of hope. Yeah. If nothing else, yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, I think we are more or less... Uh, and my microphone's turning red. That can't yeah. be good. So. Yeah. Okay. So thank you again. And, thank you, sir. And, um, enjoy the concert. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs>